What's the difference between development projects versus standing assets that are already existing? And how is retail doing? We're going to talk about that and more on today's episode of Ready to Scale. Let's get ready to scale. My name is Jeanette Friedrich, Director of Investor Relations at Blue Lake Capital. Joining me today is my good friend, Garrett Bedrin. He is the owner and developer at Allied Suites, LLC, which you might actually recognize as Salons by JC. In addition to that, he is the partner at the Bedrin Organization, where he oversees investor relations, acquisitions, and leasing of shopping centers and more. Their portfolio can currently consist of about 2 million square feet in six different states. He's got a, B a bachelor's of science in sports management from UMass Amherst, and he's joining us today from New York City. So, Garrett, welcome to the show. Jeanette, thanks for having me. It's always good to reconnect with old friends and, you know, catching up with you and Ellie is uh, just fantastic. So happy to hear about the wonderful things that you guys are up to and uh, always love uh, being a guest on your show. So thanks for having me back. Oh, well, thank you, Garrett. We sincerely appreciate and the feeling is very mutual. We appreciate you being on and and uh, we get to talk about a lot of fun stuff behind the scenes is the truth. And so I thought it would be fun today for us to actually hit record so people can hear, you know, a lot of the cool stuff we get to talk about behind the scenes. And, you know, given that your expertise and experience and is in retail, you know, which we really don't know hardly anything about, you know, we're, we're focused on multifamily. I wanted to ask you to basically summarize the state of retail right now. I mean, it's been a ride. Wow, no no pressure. Let me start, first I wanna say happy birthday to my daughter Harper, she turned 10 uh, and this is a busy week. We have a lot of birthdays uh, in our family in October. And in order to summarize retail, I've gotta think about my wife and my daughters because they are enjoying themselves and, and, and spending time and money together at shopping centers and um, retail is hot, hot, hot. It's so interesting. Um, I've been through a number of different cycles now in the market, um, overall, the stock market, the retail market, the lending market. And when I got into the business in 2005, so just about 20 years now, there was a lot of talk in 07 and 08 that developers had overbuilt, that we were over retailed in this country, uh, that online shopping was going to put us all out of business that Walmart was going to put every store out of business, that Amazon was going to put everybody out of business. And nothing was built, I guess, from 07 to the, the COVID period. So, you know, we go through this tremendous recession in, I guess, 08, the Great Recession. I was getting married then. And this tremendous pullback and, you know, the death of retail. Um, and then you go through other periods where multifamily got very, very hot, obviously, and people were building a ton, especially through areas that, you know, both our companies invest in the Southeast and kind of retail became this like forgotten child. Right. Um, and you, and you hear about, you know, what's going to happen to all these malls. Are they all going to be converted to apartment complexes? And then you get to, you know, COVID and everything's shut down. Right. And I think what people really realized from being locked up in their homes is that they were missing getting outside, being together, socializing, whether it's meeting a friend for a cup of coffee, working out at an Orange Theory or Planet Fitness together, having a smoothie at a pliables type place, um, and just the overall experience of shopping, not to mention the convenience of um, shopping from home and having the food delivered or items delivered uh, through whether it's Uber or DoorDash. And guess what? These places, they have to pick the stuff up from your nearby shopping center. You can't pick up food, you know, three hours away from Chick-fil-A and expect it to be warm when you get it uh, back to someone's house. So I think all of that has brought retail into the forefront again, and it's become a landlord's market. You know, I have to wear two hats. I'm a tenant at Salon by, Salons by JC, and I'm a landlord with the family business. But from the landlord's side, nothing's been built since that 08 period we talked about earlier. So you almost have this kind of 15 to 20 year um, you know, slowdown of, of new starts for retail. And I got to tell you, Jeanette, with the exception of one property where we're specifically looking to uh, look at a redevelopment, you know, we're 96, 97% rented throughout about 2 million square feet for the family. Um, and, you know, rents that used to be 11 and $13 are easily hitting $20 a square foot. 
So retail is back, baby. What do you think about that? <laughs> Very well summarized. I loved it. I loved it. And you bring up a lot of really interesting points. Um, you know, we on the show, typically, you know, we're multifamily, multifamily, multifamily. So I just find it really interesting to understand other types of avenues that people take with their investments. And so I wanted you to ask, I wanted to ask you if you could explain to us, basically, what is, can you compare and contrast essentially the business and investment strategies of a development project versus standing retail? Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's a great question, which I didn't answer. That's like part B of the first intro. Um, so being a developer, as you know, from the multifamily side of the business uh, versus buying something existing, I mean, that is a whole nother world of investment risk, right? And I think that goes true, whether it's multifamily, retail, industrial, there are so many unknowns when you become a developer. The big risk, right, that everybody talks about is entitlement risk. How long will it take the local town to give you the rights to entitle you to proceed with the project that you see fit? Um, is it a project that maybe had an environmental issue that's got to be cleaned up and you need the you know, DEP or FEMA or somebody of that you know, venture to, uh, to kind of bless? Is it a local town of you know, um, retired uh, professionals who know nothing about real estate, but they happen to be on a board that they're voted on by their friends and family, and they're the ones that are going to decide What's the best use? Um, or is it kind of professionals, architects, engineers? There's a lot of conversation about who should be making those decisions in a town. Should it be local? Should it be county? Should it be state-based, right? Should it be a federal kind of um, a federal approval level if you're doing a certain type of project like affordable housing? There's a lot of talk about that. So that's the biggest risk, understanding, can you actually get this entitled? Then you've got to figure out, Jeanette, Who's going to be that anchor tenant that gets you your financing, that gets you that shovel in the ground? So most people will say, well, grocery is gold, right? Let's get our Publix. Let's get Wegmans. Let's get um, Stop and Shop or Walmart uh, as the anchor tenant. Well, the little secret is that you don't really make much money on the grocery store. These grocery stores, as great as experience it is, and they bring tons and tons of customers that shop every day and every week, they pay very low rents and even worse they lock you up for a very long time. So whereas in an apartment, you and Ellie may sign a lease for one year. If the market moves and that $1,000 rent is $1,300, you're going to say to the person, hey, you got to pay $1,200, $1,300. You got to get closer to market or we're going to bring somebody else in new. And there's always somebody else that needs an apartment. But with the retail, you're going to sign a 20-year lease with that anchor. And let's say you charge them you know, $10 a square foot. They may only agree to pay you $11 or they may only pay you $10 for the next 30, 40, 50 years. So if that market moves, it's very tough for you to, um, to, to make that money back because you're locked up in a long-term lease. Now your lender loves that, right? Because they can sleep nice at, at night and say, oh, I'm, I'm not worried. Publix is going to pay the rent. And that's true. There's some good things with that. And you'll be able to tell the local tenants like your dry cleaner, your little restaurant, your small fitness center, your yoga studio, um, you're going to say, listen, Publix is bringing millions of people a year. Uh, I'm going to charge you $25 a square foot, even though Publix only pays 10. You have to pay more to basically make up the, the difference. So you got to get that anchor tenant. The other risk, Jeanette, is, of course, what's underneath the ground, right? You got to be very careful with development. Um, a site may look to be fine, but when you start doing your soil sampling, uh, can you dig deep enough? Uh, what's it going to cost you to put in more rocks or uh, what's called piles where you have to pile drive and, and, and build on top of that? That stuff gets expensive very quickly. And what do you find in there? Is the soil good? Is the soil bad? What's the water table level? Uh, that's some stuff that you could really lose your shirt on if you don't figure that, that out early in the process, um, because that's a major, a major cost. And unfortunately, it's, some of it's unknown. Even if you get every test and um, everything passes, you start digging you know, we found some stuff in one of our projects where we had to bring in more rock to support it. And that costs a few hundred thousand dollars. It's significant. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're buying something stabilized, you have a really good viewpoint of what's there, kind of your worst case scenario, right? You know, Dollar Tree has a four year lease. Raw Stress for Less has 20 years of options um, unless they go bankrupt, which, of course, is possible. Uh, Big Lots just went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, who's been around, been a good tenant 
for a long time, you know, you kind of know what's there. So your strategy there is more of what's the day one return on my investment based on the next 12 months. In multifamily, you do like T12, right? Trailing 12, trailing three, trailing one. In retail, you look at forward 12 um, because you have leases in place that are guaranteed, again, unless they go bankrupt. So you wouldn't use last year's rents to establish the market. You would use next year's rents because it's already under lease agreement. In multifamily, you don't know if you know John Smith is going to renew 12 months from now. You just don't know. It's, it's totally different. So you would go through those numbers and you would say, all right, can I achieve an 8%, a 10%, whatever your investment thesis is, right? That supports it. Um, and obviously the debt's going to be a little different than, than a multifamily as well. Um, but when you're looking at that, you, you're very much cash flow driven and you want to understand, can I move tenants around? Can I get a higher rent here or higher rent there? Um, development, you're more looking for that bigger pop, right? You want to, uh, you want to buy the different pieces and then kind of assemble the dinner <laughs> and then sell it, you know, at a higher price. Um, although a lot of developers want to refinance and just, you know, own it in perpetuity. That's, that's a great plan too. So a little bit of differences, a little bit of risk differences, uh, Development, you typically get a bigger return because you're taking risk. You're signing personally for that construction loan. Whereas if you buy it stabilized, Jeanette, you can typically get a non-recourse loan uh, on your shopping center. Very, very good summary. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, very well done. That was a lot to explain uh, in a in a little package, and you did a great job of that. <laughs> Is that like three weeks worth of podcast? Are we good? <laughs> That's a wrap, Jeanette. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, along those lines, you know, we're talking about and you're using really great examples and things that are very easy for people to relate and and kind of understand. Um, but let's talk about, you know, not a fictitious example, but let's talk about actually your most recent project. So you just completed a project that took 13 years. Right. Tell me right. all about it. Wow. Wow. Well, you, you kind of measure it by my hairline, I guess, or my, <laughs> my kids love to point out. Um, so we're, we're extremely proud of a project that we did finally complete. We're actually in the middle of doing the refinance now to go into more of a permanent financing. So in 2000 and I want to say uh, middle of 2008, I, I believe June of 08, we bought seven acres in a town called Hawthorne, New Jersey. It's uh, near Paramus, New Jersey, just a very strong infill area right by the train to New York, right by the town fields. And we own a shopping center on that street. And so we heard about this uh, seven or eight acres being you know, put up for sale. And we said, we'd love to buy it. We want to continue to grow retail. The town really wanted retail. In fact, they were passing very favorable zoning for, for retail. So we had a deal in hand with Kohl's department stores. And Kohl's was going to build two-story um building. It's called a ground lease where we basically we were going to prepare the ground and, and do all the utilities uh, and they were going to actually build the building and it was going to be 50,000 feet over 50,000 feet. So, you know, elevator, escalator. And uh, this is a really great learning lessons for people that are kind of new in the business. Um, you probably shouldn't close on the property until you actually have the lease fully what's called non-refundable. And this was a mistake that, that we made. And I'm happy to talk about all of our mistakes because that's what you learn, you know, uh, success is really rooted in the seeds of failure. So we have, we've, we've learned a lot from that. Um, and we started to do all of the uh, architecture and engineer. And again, the zoning was in place at that point with this overlay zone for retail. And then what happened was, you know, September 08, the great recession hits and Lehman Brothers falls out and the world changes. And Cole says, you know, we're not going to do that deal. And they had the ability to get out of that deal. It wasn't final, final, final. And we had already bought the property. So what's it like sitting and holding a property you just spent $7 million for with no plan? You better have a big portfolio and a family behind you to um, to make a go of it because you could lose your shirt for sure. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge. And it was a tough, humbling uh, period. And after a couple of years, we picked ourselves off the ground and um there was um, this interest from Walmart and it was called Walmart Neighborhood Market, which was a, um, a very small grocery store. They're in the Southeast. They're, they're really not up here in New Jersey. 
maybe it was 40 or 50,000 square feet. And funny enough, the town had done a survey through, I guess, the Chamber of Commerce. And it said, what's the number one thing the town wants uh, in this area? And it was supermarket. And we thought, wow, we're delivering you a supermarket. Well, um, again, another mistake we made was that we didn't really fully listen and understand to what some of the residents' concerns were, because it turns out that the residents really didn't want a Walmart and that there is a bad connotation that goes with Walmart. And a small group of residents formed a group and um, they called themselves Hawthorne Deserves Better Than Walmart. And they went and, you know, we kind of blew them off and didn't think it was anything uh, because the zoning was there. And they went and found a very, very wealthy backer who owned another grocery store who did not want Walmart. And they went and challenged everything in court and yada, yada, yada. And one day Walmart came to us and said, you know, I don't think we're going to hang around and wait two, three years for this to work out. So, you know, I, you guys want to go fight it in court? And we say, well, we don't know what to do here. Uh, if you're not going to hang around, I don't think we're going to be spending money on, on lawsuits. And uh, basically the Walmart fell, fell apart and they said they weren't willing to wait. So we picked ourselves back up <laughs> ah. and we said, what are we going to do now? And around that time, there was... Um, some new language that was passed, I think it was like a grant program in New Jersey, where they said, if you build a transit oriented project within a quarter mile of the train station, we'll give you X amount of dollars for tax rebates and grants. But they said it was going to be relevant in only seven or eight towns. Well, we were not one of those towns, but I went on to Google Earth and you couldn't have done this years earlier because we didn't have Google Earth. And, and now is a phenomenal game changer for the industry uh, for site visits. And I went on to Google Earth and I measured with their little ruler the distance from the train station. And golly gee, we were less than a quarter mile. So I said to the family, you know what? We're probably not going to get this grant because we're not in the right area. But let's keep going with a project that fits everything they said. And we'll just kind of act as if we're doing the type of project that the state really wants, you know, which is apartments with retail and office. So we teamed up with a developer. Um, we ended up... Um, you know, presenting our plans and going to the zoning board. And after a year at the zoning board, because you needed different zoning and this was not approved, the town said, no, we don't want that. Well, what a slap in the face that felt like. Uh. And a punch in the gut. And you won't believe this, Jeanette, but 20 people from Hawthorne Deserves Better from Walmart came to the meeting and said, we like this project. They've listened. We support it. And that never happened. People never come and say good things. They <laughs> say bad things <laughs> it's true wow so that was just a punch in the gut and so at that time we felt the only way forward was to um sue the town regarding affordable housing and every town in new jersey for those of you who are listening from other states um new jersey has a, a very strong affordable housing mandate it's called coa and uh, every town has to have a certain amount and most towns don't have the right amount. And it's been a long, long process and exhausting and it's constantly changing. It's very confusing. And turns out the only way you get multifamily built in New Jersey is by doing what we had to do. So we went to the town and said, listen, you need units for affordable housing and we can build them. And of course they said, no, we don't want that. And it became a back and forth, back and forth. And finally a mediator got involved and, and the town said, listen, We'll, we can finally do a hundred. And we said, thank you. And we said, what else? And they said, well, we don't want them near the neighbor because the neighbor has trucks that turn on at six in the morning and that could disturb, we, you know, the trucks could disturb the, the residents to which I scratched my head and said, wait a minute, my residents disturb the trucks or the trucks disturb my residents. <laughs> but they were interested in protecting the trucks. So they said, uh, you can't put them there. So my attorney said, what about self-storage? which I had never heard of in my life. Uh, I mean, I've seen him driving along the road, didn't really understand the business model. And they said, yeah, that'd be fine. You can put a self-storage building there. That'll kind of be a buffer between the trucks. So turns out one of our architects uh, used to work for CubeSmart and said, oh, this would be great for them. They knew all their specs. They introduced us to CubeSmart, which is kind of like Marriott, where it's like a management company who has the brand, the name, the, the staff, but we own it and they run it for us. So we partnered up with them and we built a beautiful first-class climate-controlled 
a 120,000 square feet building. It's on four stories, so about 30,000 per story. Has a retail spot in the front, has outside garages. Um, and it's a really great business. We're learning that. We actually spent a couple hundred grand and putting in a um, system for the, so there's no locks. Everything's on your phone. You unlock the entrance from your phone. There's no, nobody can cut your lock because there's no lock. So the unit is um, Bluetooth and Wi Fi enabled. Like you, my mom has a unit. I can unlock it for her from my phone in my office. So people love that tech. And, um, you know, when you live in an apartment and you sell your house and you renovate or you downsize, you need storage. It worked mm -hmm. really, really well. Apartments are all about space and price per square foot, right? When you and Ellie figure out, what am I charging? Two bucks a square foot. So space is a premium, especially if you're in Northern New Jersey and New York where the rents are insane, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we have rented like 65% of that building uh, in the past year and a half. We're well on our way. Uh, we're ahead of budget, which is really exciting. And we have a great partner with the with the Cube Smart. And then we said, what else could we do? Well, we love retail, they said. So we we thought it would be a great mix to have a health and wellness um, component. So we put in Planet Fitness, and I have three Planet Fitnesses, one in uh, North Carolina, one in St. Louis, and then one now in New Jersey. So they took 16,000 feet, uh, and they are doing really, really well. It's a beautiful Planet Fitness, nice locker rooms. They have uh, something called the Black Card Spa, which is like um, massages and tanning, and, and these hydro beds uh, for a water massage. It's quite lovely. Wow. Then, Planet Fitness has really <laughs> stepped it up. I did not yeah. know that. Huh? And they have a mezzanine in there. And it's just a beautiful gym. Um, very busy, very successful. And then next door, we have a physical therapist uh, who could help you if you have a sports injury. And then we have a, um, it, it's called Fitrition that's going to be opening. Um, it's basically like smoothies, acai bowls, protein-based little sandwiches and um, uh, wraps, things like that. Things that you would have for health conscious um, because the brand that we created was called Hedges at Hawthorne. That's the multifamily brand. And it's all about a lot of natural light. We have uh, floor to ceiling windows, nine foot ceilings, all LED, lots of beautiful uh, natural woods, and even uh, a green wall when you come in that's uh, preserved moss. So health and wellness has always been super important to me. Um, so we felt those, those uses really came together nicely. So 13 years for approvals, We've been through the Great Recession. We've been through COVID. We've been through supply chain hell where we couldn't get power, couldn't get elevator equipment, electrical equipment, uh, needed extra rock in the ground, uh, inflation, interest rates going up, literally been through it all. 13 years, two years to build it, one year to lease it up. And now we're in the refi. So this has been going on my entire marriage. I'll be celebrating my, <laughs> my 16 year anniversary this weekend. I'm not kidding. This whole project has been my entire, but you know what? We kept going, persevered, uh, never gave up. And it's a, operationally, it's a big hit. I mean, it's better than the, the Kohl's, better than the Walmart. We're, we're actually thrilled. And at the groundbreaking, the guy that was heading the Walmart, uh, sorry, Hawthorne deserves better than Walmart campaign. He was there. I said, Joe, you were correct. Hawthorne deserved better. And we gave them better. Nice. Nice. Oh, Garrett, I have to have you on the show like 15 more times because there's so much material there that I just want to unpack. But for yeah. the purposes of today's show, uh, phenomenal story, insane story. The plan that has ultimately come together definitely was not the plan that you started with. No and it is a wonderful story of, you know, resilience and uh, adapting to the challenges that you know that come before you and and that really is sometimes i believe the essence of owning and operating real estate period whatever kind it may be you know you have a business plan it looks great on paper and then reality hits always and that really becomes the true story of how that goes so so, funny so wow. i was i was invited to speak at our temple um friday night for the kol nidre service uh, before Yom Kippur. And they said, they said, we want you to speak. We know you're really inspirational. You have a lot of great things going on in your, in your life. And I said, well, what, do, what do you want me to talk about? So fundraising. They said, no, we want you to talk about whatever you want to talk about. So I'm going to talk. I know this is going to air after. So <laughs> I'm going to talk about it, that life is a deck of cards and it's not the cards you're dealt, but it's how you play your hand. 
and you just hit on a number of key points. What you absolutely, just said. absolutely, absolutely. All right. Well, this has been wonderful. Now, I do want to also find out kind of forward looking, you know, what which markets you see have a lot of potential and uh, and also kind of what plans you have, uh, you know, for yourself moving forward. But before we do, let's have a word from our sponsor. Ready to Scale is brought to you by Blue Lake Capital, where we hunt down the best multifamily investment opportunities that we can find and invite investors to join in with us. We target Class B value-add multifamily properties across the Sun Belt. Our CEO, Ellie Perlman, invests a substantial amount of capital into every deal. This means our interests are aligned with yours. If you're an accredited investor looking to expand your portfolio and diversify sponsors, be sure to visit us at bluelake-capital.com. Blue Lake Capital, be bold, be extraordinary, and keep moving forward. All right. So Garrett, uh, an insane story. So my first question for you is now what? Now what's the plan? Are you going to hold this in perpetuity and hopefully let this thing pay for itself 15 times over since it put you through, you know, so much? What are you, what are the ultimately the plans with this big project that you finally got completed? Yeah, we we built Hedges of Hawthorne um, to be a long-term family hold. This is a maybe once in a generational asset. I mean, it's a a walking distance of the train to New York City in a, a northern New Jersey market that is just so challenging. I mean, young couples that move here that want to buy a home, um, I, I just don't know how they're going to do it. You know, it's going to be a million dollars to get a home. And uh, I guess people are going to hand down homes to their kids because it's just becoming unaffordable. And so, you know, renting by choice and having a luxury product with incredible amenities. Um, we actually have a room where you can um, rent wine lockers and store your beverages and rent out this beautiful room for for kind of a private dining experience. We have a hair salon in the building, Jeanette, from my other business. Of I'm course. Sure. Very we smart. Love, we love seeing that. Um, and, and so really, I look at this and look, I mean, you fall in love with your kids, not your real estate. Everything at one point could be for sale, but this was so hard <laughs> to, to do. It's a constant reminder of how hard the family has worked and what we've all been through that I, I, I don't think we're, we're going to sell it. I think we're going to refi it and um, and just operate it and, and own it and, you know, enjoy the fruits of our labor. Uh, it's fantastic cash flow that it creates. And look, hopefully in a few years, interest rates will continue to uh, decline. And, you know, you you start to look really good when you can do a refi on a big loan and save half a point or a point. Mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing how uh, that that magic happens. So for us, that's the long term hold. Um, we're going to continue to look for projects, especially retail projects, where in the future, there could be a mixed use component. So that's something different about our company that separates us from others. Uh, we have a very patient capital group, whether it's our friends and family or just our family office. We look at assets that we could buy uh, where one day we can knock down half of it and build apartments or build storage. And, you know, maybe it's 10 years later and we've gotten all our money out of it. And so when you have all your money out of it, you have more of an appetite for taking some risk because you've returned the initial investment. So an example would be in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is my number one pick market for your question <laughs> earlier, would be um, we have some uh, shopping centers that we're actively looking at right now, knocking down uh, significant parts and doing luxury apartments. So keeping retail in the front, doing multifamily in the back. Greensboro, North Carolina, I don't want to give away all the secrets, uh, but if you haven't heard about Greensboro, every single electric vehicle battery for Toyota and Lexus will be built just south of Greensboro. Toyota has committed uh, $15 billion and 5,000 jobs. And this area in Guilford County is like 14,000 housing units short already. And they need more housing. And they need more reasonably priced housing for the workforce. Mm -hmm. But so many companies are moving to North Carolina. Uh, I'm just super proud and thankful of their leadership. They've gone out of their way to recruit companies from other countries and from other uh, other, other states, of course, to, to come down here. I know you guys have done some great deals mm -hmm. in, in North Carolina. I think you had a deal in Burlington, maybe, or um, i trying to remember. But uh, not not so far from me. I mean, mm -hmm. so th this is not a surprise to you and to Ellie how wonderful this this market is. Uh, and that includes, you know, Winston-Salem and High Point, and, and there's, you know, 30, 40 minutes 
we bought a property in Lexington in February that we're thrilled with. That's kind of the barbecue capital, I guess, of the state. <laughs> and, you know, this Lexington has like four major uh, factory expansions that are all going on at the same time. And um, there's just no apartments available. And it's going to take a few years for more, you know, new construction. It takes time to get approvals and get built and filled up. And as those prices increase, those rents will increase. And that makes what, you know, owning some of the older stuff kind of really valuable. So we always look for projects that have kind of two strategies an in place existing cash flow that meets our expectations. Sometimes that's 8%, sometimes that's 10 or 12, depends on capital cost and interest rates. And then we think about what can we also do that's going to double our, you know, uh, double our equity, I guess an equity multiple. Some mm -hmm. people may have heard that term. Um, in you know five to ten years, and then we can have some real fun and go to kind of phase two or or stage two of the investment. Um, so Greensboro is number one. Obviously, we're staying focused here in northern New Jersey. Um, you know, I've heard some great things about Florida. We own a hair salon down there. Uh, I heard that over two million people moved to Florida after COVID and never came home. And uh, just go spend a week down there on vacation, Palm Beach or West Palm Beach. Tremendous development going on. Um, Related, Steve Ross has put millions of dollars into new office buildings in downtown West Palm. So I would say somewhere in that West Palm, Palm Beach area, um, very wealthy people are moving there to save money on taxes. And, you know, when Ken Griffin from Citadel goes down to the Four Seasons and brings the whole company and, you know, these billionaires are buying four or five oceanfront parcels and assembling incredible homes for themselves, that tells me the entire company is going to need a place to live, to shop, to eat to work out, to get their hair done. Um, and so I think those employees start to follow some of these billionaires. Mm -hmm. And I just think those markets are going to be really good. So I gave you two. That's it. Mm -hmm. No more secrets. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, and today is, as we're recording this, Wednesday, October 9th. And as we all know, there is a hurricane headed straight for Florida. So oh. my heart and thoughts go out to all those folks there. And hopefully uh, it remains a desirable market by the end of this week still, which yes. I'm sure ultimately it will. Um, sure. That is a challenge, though, because the insurance industry, as you guys know, on the multifamily side, mm -hmm. insurance has been one of the biggest issues that developers have been and sponsors have been challenged with. Uh, you know, you go to buy a property, the insurance is 25 grand in the underwriting and then you get your your quote and it's you know 60 grand and, and it just totally changes your numbers mm -hmm. um so we you know someone's got to figure out what's what's going to happen here with florida because people in florida are just going to give up insurance um and it's just uh you know untenable kind of uh condition to to live that way and so i, I you know i feel that there'll be something with the government that steps in at some point to help people uh, with insurance in Florida, because, you know, they live in an area where everybody enjoys to visit and wants to uh, have a great time. Um, but someone's got to step up and help pay for uh, the fact that they're in the path of all these, you know, tropical storms and, and hurricanes. So we send out our our prayers and our thoughts. And of course, in North Carolina, we were very lucky with mm -hmm. Helene uh, was west, was, uh, west, you know, western North Carolina, which typically is not where the hurricanes hit. And uh, these beautiful areas near Asheville got destroyed. And everybody really loves Asheville. Um, and so, you know, our, our, our thoughts go out to those families and victims. And I know we have tenants that have friends and family who have been affected and we've been raising money and collecting food at some of our salons for them. Um, so I did want to mention that also. Yeah, no, and, and I appreciate that. We're, we are also grateful. Um, it was a little bit of a, a stressful, you know, uh, moment for us as well, because we have properties in Atlanta, we have properties in, on Charlotte, in Mebane, um, you know, and it was, you know, you, you don't think, oh, a hurricane is going to be a threat to properties in, in, you know, the Carolinas, but I, indeed, indeed, I mean, you know, you, you have to be aware of, of all the possibilities and Thankfully, all of our properties were fine. All of our tenants were fine. But, um, you know, that is one of those scarier aspects about truly being an owner and operator, you know, that people also forget. They hear the the stories and the shiny, the, you know, they think it's all money and money and great and this is all fun and easy, you know, but there's all these other complications, um, you know, that really do pull at your heart and, and that you are responsible for ultimately as much as whatever is in your control. So, you know, um, I appreciate you highlighting that and bringing attention to that. And, and we are definitely hoping for the best for Florida, uh, by the, in the next 48 hours. I mean, frankly, yeah. so, and you, you know, Jeanette, you mentioned Mebane. That's a great market. That's mm -hmm. part of our market that we talk about 
um, you know, and, and maybe one day when Ellie's finished turning that around, she'll, she'll call me and try to, <laughs> uh, that's a great area because you're kind of between, you know, the triad, uh, which is Greensboro, Winston, High Point, and then Raleigh, Chapel Hill, Durham, Mm Research -hmm. Triangle, that whole area in between is, is a really smart area for, for you to invest and, and for us to look as well. And so that's, I just want to identify that, that that's a great spot you guys are in there. Oh, appreciate it. And we we have you on speed dial. So we will, uh, when we're ready to exit, we'll let you know. <laughs> right. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Well, before I let you go, Garrett, as you know, uh, we always end each episode with the lightning round questions, which you have done these before, but I actually think it's always fun to ask it again because people change. You have new lessons you learn along the way. You know, you have, you gain new perspective to things. So are you ready? Wow. Um, wait, I want to mention one more thing before we go to lightning round. Is that okay? Sure, yeah, of course. Um, I'm talking about retail changing. So my wife surprised me with a small little uh, birthday party, very small, just a couple couple couples. And it was at a bowling place at the mall. All right. So you think about your typical mall store, your Macy's, your Neiman Marcus, your Nordstrom's, your Bloomingdale's, your Saks, right? Those are being replaced with fun, exciting, experiential um, locations. So this place has food, has a DJ, has drinks, has little private rooms with three or four bowling lanes, um, and it's at the mall. And then the next day, my daughter had her birthday party at a cosmetic store at the mall. And as we walked around after the party, we found this place called Arena, which is focusing on STEM, right? So science, technology, engineering, mathematics, all those important things in school that the kids need to learn. And inside this facility, was basically a place to fly drones, a place to race cars, a place to make cars, a place to race boats. It was all little hobbies and tracks, and they were selling, you know, little mechanical toys you can make and have birthday parties. And then next door was a place called Nerf under construction, some Nerf experience where I guess you throw Nerf balls at each other or have a big field that's going to be opening soon. So, you know, we always said retail's not dying, it's just changing, right? And it's very healthy for kind of the bottom feeders uh, to retire and join the dinosaurs and let some of the new boys and girls step up and have an opportunity to showcase uh, original ideas and things that bring people together. So um, I'm excited for this next kind of um, retail adventure and seeing what, what new concepts come to life. That was actually a perfect answer to the question, because I don't know if you remember, but the first question is, what do you do for fun? All of that sounded super fun, you know, <laughs> and and it makes a lot of sense because, uh, you know, because people do value experiences more now than I think they used to. And I think that's one of the residual effects from actually COVID is I think it helped us to reassess and reclaim some value in in the benefit of experiential um, moments in life and how those have intangible value to them. And frankly, COVID was mighty stressful and we all just want to kind of have a good time and, and, you know, calm down, you know? And so I think that's a, that was a great answer actually to the first question and also on point. No, pickleball is my, is my official answer. Ah. (laughs) I am just loving the pickleball. My goodness, that is so fun. And, and I love it because it's so fair and balanced. A 60 year old woman could beat my 45 year old, butt no problem. Um, because you don't have to be this big, fast, strong person. It's, it's a game of skill and thinking and putting it where the opponent isn't. And that's a place where you'll see old grocery stores or an old industrial building with high ceilings and good lighting that can get converted easily to a pickleball court and every multifamily facility needs to have pickleball now maybe you take your old tennis court you resurface it or reline it um so question number one the lightning round i don't even hear the tick 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 in my ear (laughs) people on this podcast uh so you're not used to having someone who has their own own podcast i want to hear the tick 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 Start the, start the lightning round officially. <laughs> you know, that's fun. I'm going to actually recommend to my team that we actually start to do that. That will make it more fun. And I agree with you also. I actually just said a few weeks ago uh, to some of my team members that I actually was very seriously saying we should put a pickleball court <laughs> on this property um, because it has a huge following too. I mean, it's almost becoming like almost culty like, like people in their yeah. pickleball, you know, and we can right. take advantage of that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, you know, I play every Monday night in like an open play it's an hour and a half and uh you just you know if you're on the court randomly with four people or or three other people if you win you 
you split up with your partner so you don't dominate. You go to another court. And if you lose, you go off the court. And until the next person loses, you come back on. So you ultimately play with everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's just incredible of the different types of people, ages, uh, athletic ability, and everyone has different strengths and different weaknesses. And that's what I love about it. You know, it's not like you're playing, you know, if you were playing football or basketball against somebody in a totally different weight class or age or gender, it may not be as competitive here. You're competitive with everybody. Um, it's a bigger pool of people to play with. I mean, I play with my parents. It, it's just, it's, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. I really enjoy it. My wife and I love it. It's a great couple's uh, hobby. And, you know, you're not stuck like golf is a whole day, four hours. You're out there, you're far away, which is great. That's got a lot of benefits too. I like this. It's like an hour, hour and a half. And then you move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. All right. Well, now this is going to maybe make the next question a little harder, which is what is something most people don't know about you? <sighs> something most people don't know about me. I used to say people didn't know I had hair salons. We used to tell <laughs> my grandma I was a hairstylist because she, <laughs> you know, she got a real, real kick out of that. Um, okay. Here's something. I used to be a Met fan when I was little, and now I'm a Yankee fan. Ooh, wow. And Those are I some went, fighting words. I went to game one of the World Series in 1986, and I fell asleep. <gasps> um, I was young. I was young. But my my grandmother, who passed away in her late 90s a few months ago, it was an incredible Met fan. And she would put a dollar into a big bank, like a Coke bottle bank, every time the Mets won. Obviously, she didn't make that much money over the past <laughs> few years. Um, but it's just our whole family is glued right now. Even if you're not a Met fan, you are rooting for the Mets right now uh, because we just can't believe that right after she passed away, they finally have this great season. And, you know, we think she's cheering them on and we're hoping that they have a great uh, playoff race. Ah, very nice. Very nice. All right. Now, Garrett, the third question is, what is a book that you would recommend somebody read? In particular, I would say, if they're actually interested in understanding and learning more about retail. Or are there even enough resources, well, actually? I don't think I, yeah, there's not that many books on retail. Let's make it more broad. We'll just say real okay. estate. Um, so I just finished a book at the end of the summer called Billionaire's Row. And I have a copy of it. If you anybody wants me to send it to them or you and Ellie want to read it, just let me know. And it's basically the story about maybe five or six different bu buildings that were built um, on 57th Street and right around that area by Central Park South in, in Manhattan and kind of how the deals came together and the equity and the debt and the challenges of, of COVID. Um, and it's a lot of big personalities, you know, different big, big players in New York. Um, and I was glued to the book and, you know, these are incredible skyscrapers and some of them have a lot of challenges and some of them did really well and some of them had poor timing. Um, so Billionaire's Row is definitely a book I'd recommend. Very interesting. Yeah, I have not even heard of that. So it's I, obviously it's um, it's, you know, fresh off the the press here, which is cool. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, now, the um, other question for you today, and you've answered this before, but again, I, you know, there's always layers that can be added upon it is, you know, when we talk about all of this stuff, yes, real estate is fun and there's all kinds of stuff that goes along with it. And of course, we want to make money and we want to have good returns, but it's not the point. The point is that we want to be capable and positioned to be able to build and to live extraordinary lives. And so what is your advice for someone that is trying to do that? Wow, I think you you hit on it. Um, it's all about the value and in, in the kind of how you value your time because life is short, right? And you know, being in in the commercial real estate business gives you the ability to drive your daughter to school or go to her soccer game or you know take her to the salon. Um, I love doing pickup for dance and my kids and being part of their lives and, you know, being able to set your own schedule and being a little bit more remote. And, you know, this summer I worked from uh, from the Hamptons where, where, where we have a home and was able to, you know, 95 percent kind of do everything that I that I typically do. Um, so the flexibility that, you know, real estate gives you, especially in a, in a connected world where uh, you're you're much more focused on building relationships and, and that can be done over Zoom, over Microsoft Teams, whatever it may be, through your phone, um, checking in with your investors, your lenders. Uh, it doesn't have to be done in a nine to five typical office. Now, with that comes the idea that if you have clients or investors or you know, stakeholders, 
you are available 24 seven as well. Mm -hmm. And of course you have to set those boundaries, which you know, I'm always working on, um, you know, but a lot of business is done on a Saturday or Sunday. Um, you know, you're always thinking about business. I love reading kind of North Carolina newspapers, Sunday mornings, taking pictures of articles. And then, you know, Monday following up with like a broker and saying, Hey, did you hear about this deal? Or this is cool. Think about this for the project we're working on next year. I like what they did here. So, you know, always being able to, um, you know, uh, document where you are and, and what you see around you, I think is so important. And part of what I love kind of being able to be outside the office. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Now, last but not least, Garrett, if people want to get in touch with you, how can they find you? Yeah. I mean, we've got it all right here, right? Um, so on, on Instagram, uh, my personal Instagram is Garrett Graham. So it's G-A two R's, E-T, and then G-R-A-M, Garrett Graham. Um, of course, the uh, Bedroom organization has their own Instagram, Hedges at Hawthorne. You can always connect on LinkedIn. Um, I love when people reach out and say hello, and I'm happy to, um, you know, happy to help. I've always been someone that's felt like, um, the more you give, the more you get. And so I'm, I'm happy to give as long as people respect time and boundaries, I'm happy to share best practices. There's no, there's no secret. I think the more you help, uh, the more it comes back to you, you know, and, uh, uh, especially if someone's up and coming in the industry and wants to pick my brain for 10, 15 minutes, you know, reach out, uh, love to say hello and hear what you're up to. I can learn a lot from you. Um, and I've learned a lot from you and from Ellie and, you know, I appreciate our friendship and our, uh, working together and sharing best practices. And, you know, the time will come when something hits together that, that we all feel comfortable with, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I welcome that and look forward to it. Well, thank you so much for your time, your wonderful insights, fabulous storytelling. Um, I definitely will have you back on the show again, because there's so much more I want to unpack now after all of that. Oh, I mean, that's like a seven part series, Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I have to relive it all again. Wow. Like, <laughs> I mean, my wife would sit there. She was like knitting during the, um, you know, planning board and zoning meetings. And, and <laughs> saying, you keep going with this thing. Why don't you give up? Give up. You know, they don't want you here. And uh, oh, my God, we've just been through it all. Incredible. You sure have. If you're ever in the area and you want a tour, you know, uh, reach out to me. I'd, we'd love to show you the project. Uh, you you know, Jeanette or or any of, of your listeners that are in New York, New Jersey and want to get a, a VIP tour, come on in. We'll we'll show you around. We're we're really proud of it. Well, good, good. And we do actually have a lot of investors concentrated in the New England area. So you guys, if you're listening, reach out to Garrett and go take a look. But thank you again so much for coming on the show, Garrett. And for those of you that invested your time with us today, thank you. Please don't forget to like, rate, and review the show. Leave us some comments. Let us know more that you'd like to learn about. And in the meantime, be bold, be extraordinary, and keep moving forward.